This is KP Wee with This Week in BC Minor League Sports here on CJSF 90.1 FM. You can also listen in at cjsf.ca and uh, on TELUS HD channel 7014 as we're broadcasting from Burby, British Columbia. Now, it's an exciting time for young amateur hockey players in our, in our country this month as the uh, playoffs have begun in many provinces for both junior and midget leagues. And it's no different here in the province of British Columbia as the uh, BC Major Midget Hockey League began its playoffs a week ago and we saw four very exciting series indeed. Now a couple of upsets as well as a couple of sweeps along the way. Uh, fortunately for me as a fan um, and you know, for you as well if you uh, happen to check uh, the action out. Uh, uh, but hey, fortunately for me as a fan, two of the four series took place here in the Lower Mainland. Uh, one of them was the Vancouver Northwest Giants, who play home games in Burnaby, uh, hosting the underdog South Island Royals, a team from Victoria. Um, the other series taking place here in the Lower Mainland was the Vancouver Northeast Chiefs, who normally play in Coquitlam, hosting the Valley West Hawks in Port Coquitlam last weekend uh, because their normal rank uh, up in Coquitlam had uh, some scheduling conflict. Uh, so, I mean, last week's weekend, or sorry, last uh, weekend's action uh, included games in Burnaby and Port Coquitlam, which was fantastic. Uh, the other two series... Uh, were the number one seed, the Caribou Cougars, hosting the Fraser Valley Thunderbirds in Prince George and also the defending champion Okanagan Rockets playing at home in Kelowna against the uh, Greater Vancouver Canadians. So let's get started with the uh, playoff recap for this week. Uh, let's begin in uh, Burnaby with the Vancouver Northwest Giants hosting South Island. And you know that series began last Friday. Uh, the Giants, who were the number two seed during the regular season, have been in the league finals with each of the last six years and we're hoping to make it seven straight uh, in the finals so definitely a um, powerhouse team uh, for the last few years uh, the South Island Royals meanwhile from what uh, from what one of the players told me when the two teams play late in the season in North Vancouver uh, apparently had never beaten the Giants ever and I don't know if that's accurate or not but uh, I didn't get a chance to find out for sure but uh, you know, it's probably true because the Giants have been a perennial powerhouse and pretty tough to beat uh, and you know the player that uh, the South Island player that talked to me uh, before kind of suggested that um, they'd never beaten uh, the Giants in the existence of the of the franchise uh, for South Island. So uh, definitely not looking good. You know, if you are you know going into the series uh, trying to uh, analyze uh, analyze this particular series, just because the Giants were playing at home, uh, they were the better team during the regular season, and uh, you know consider that the Royals have never beaten or at least have not beaten um, the Giants, you know, in recent past. That That's uh, kind of uh, very tough um, you know, to to go into the to go into the hostile rink in Burnaby and try and beat them, but nonetheless the games are played on the ice, not on paper. Uh, so let's uh, talk about this. I mean, because none of none of the um, history matter, none of the the standings matter when the puck dropped on Friday night to open the series, because uh, after. A scoreless first period, the Giants ran into some penalty problems because the referee kept calling penalties on them. Uh, midway through the second period, the Royals had a 5 on 3 advantage, and Captain Brandon Tutt put them on the scoreboard with a power play goal. Um, later in the period, defenseman Ron Warner also scored in the power play, and there was 2 nothing for the Royals. And actually, the, it seemed like um, there was. There were giant players in the penalty box throughout the period. Uh, and, you know, I know from standing uh, in the stands with the giant supporters and you know basically the parents of the players um, on the Giants side, they were pretty upset because you know the power play chances that South Island was getting was uh, a lot. Um, so the parents were just yelling and screaming about about that from the stands. Um, but I, I believe at one point, or I believe for the uh, second period, from for what I remember, there were at least three instances where the Royals had five on three man advantages. So like uh, at least three times from what I remember. So definitely a huge advantage in terms of uh, you know playing a, a shorthanded team on the ice. Um, you know for for the Royals. So they were up two nothing at that point of the game in the second period. And now despite that. Um, the Giants were actually the ones that were um, carrying the play and out shooting the Royals, and the Giants were the, the dominant team, but just ran into the penalty problems. Um, South Island goaltender Austin Ronan actually kept his team in it because, as I mentioned, the Giants were out shooting the Royals. 
uh, but trailing on the scoreboard 2 nothing. But the Giants finally scored late in the second period to make it 2-1, which you thought might be the turning point because they were down just by one goal heading into the third period. And in the third period, the Giants kept throwing the puck on the net. And uh, finally, Giants defenseman Carter Stevenson, who had celebrated his birthday the previous day, uh, scored in a wraparound and the building went nuts because it was 2-2 at that point. And all the momentum was on the Giants' side. And uh, now in regular season play, there's no overtime. Uh, you know, if the two teams play to a tie at the end of regulation. But in the playoffs, they actually play 10 minutes sudden death overtime periods. Then as the clock wound down in regulation, you had the feeling that the Giants were going to win it late or get the winner in overtime because they were pretty much controlling the play. Uh, but nobody else scored in the third period, and then the game went into the overtime without any intermission. They just, like, started the overtime after a couple minutes, um, you know, of rest. And then early in the sudden death period, the Royals were the ones that came into the Giants' zone, and the defenseman Curtis Gamble, number six of the Royals, blasted a shot from blue line that and went into the net and I think everybody was stunned while, while where I was standing, uh, where the Giants supporters were, they were stunned at that turn of events and the Royals celebrated on the eyes and they should because it was a stunning upset win for the South Island Royals as they won 3-2 to two in overtime to open the series. Um, here was the overtime hero, Curtis Gamble, the defenseman of the South Island Royals, chatting with me afterwards. We're speaking with Curtis Gamble of the South Island Royals following a big 3-2 overtime win over the Giants. Uh, and you scored the game winner. Uh, take us through that winning play. Uh, just my uh, teammate, Ganey, made a nice pass, and I kind of just shot it, hoping for the best, and it happened to go in and won. Yeah, well, would you say that's like um, probably the biggest goal that you score in this league? Definitely the biggest goal I've ever scored in this league. Yeah, the first time we've ever beaten the Giants in my three years in the league, and I think... South Island's existence, actually. Okay, so a historic victory, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, you guys actually blew a 2 nothing lead uh, in the third period. Um, were, were you guys, uh, I guess, were you guys panicked, or would you would you guys think you were going to come back and pull this off um, in, in overtime or in the third period? Uh, I wasn't panicked at all, no. I didn't really, nothing really went through my head like that at all. No, we were just focused on doing our job and playing the game when we need to. Now, um... I guess the the Giants kind of cared to play in the late stages of the game uh, to try to try and get the tie. Now moving forward, uh, what do you you guys need to do in order to um, you know win the series? Uh, we should keep playing how we're playing, get pucks deep, play in their zone, and uh, believe in ourselves and our ability to win the game. Now again, uh, I guess a historic win today. Uh, I guess the first win over the Giants, um, I, I think, in, in the team's existence. So, again, congratulations, uh, Curtis, and uh, good luck uh, tomorrow. Thanks. Another hero for the Royals was goaltender Austin Roden, and uh, here's what he had to say. We're speaking with Austin Roden, the goaltender of the South Island Royals, following a big 3-2 overtime win over the Vancouver Northwest Giants. Um, big win today. Uh, thoughts, thoughts about uh, the victory? Yeah, we were really good today as a team, I think. We rallied together in the overtime, and when we got scored on there, we didn't let up. And I think we played a really good game today. One of our best games of the season, for sure. Definitely a great game for you as well, Austin. Uh, I believe they outshot you guys in regulation and uh, carried a play in the third period, especially. Uh, thoughts about your own performance and uh, keeping the team in the game? Uh, not just, yeah, kind of keep the team in the game, stay calm, make the saves I need to make. Not much to it. All right, so just doing your job as usual. Yeah, just All do right. your job. Awesome. And um, now, what do you guys need to do uh, moving forward in order to take this series? Uh, well, we need to celebrate this win, obviously, and then tomorrow reset and back to square one. We got to do this all again tomorrow. A little bit about yourself, Austin. Uh, who would you say is your favorite NHL goalie and why? Uh, Mark Andre Fleury or Carey Price, just because they're so calm. They're Canadian kids. Price okay. is from BC. All right, and uh, just again, just to get to know you a little bit, Austin, um, who, what would you say is your favorite uh, subject in the school? Um, social studies, do the best in that. All right, and uh, any uh, favorite rock band or rock rock group or anything like that? No, not really. I listen to anything. Oh, okay, so all kinds of music. Yeah. All right. Uh, finally, favorite pregame meal? Uh, don't usually get a choice, but pasta. <laughs> okay. Alfredo. Anything good, like that. good enough. All right. Again, a big victory today over the Vancouver Northwest Giants. Uh, so, Austin, uh, great effort in goal. So, okay, congratulations again, and uh, good luck the rest of the way. Thank you very much.
Now, this was a best of three series, and the following night on Saturday, the Giants looked to pull even. They jumped out to a 2 nothing lead this time, and um, unfortunately, they saw South Island tie things up. The game went to the, into overtime again, and Nash Dab scored for the Giants, the high-scoring for for Vancouver Northwest, and the series was tied 1-1. Now, I wasn't at that game because I was covering the series happening in Port Coquitlam, but if you're a Giants fan, I'm sure... You probably would have been nervous because, you know, a seventh place team, the South Island Royals, uh, had taken the Giants to overtime in two straight games. I mean, that speaks volumes about the, you know, the parity in the league. And that, that's a good thing for the league's growth. Uh, so, which is, uh, you know, important. But, um, definitely a tight series. You know, both games could have gone either way. One shot here, one shot there. Could have changed the outcome. Um, game 3, the deciding contest, it was played at 9.30am at the Burby Winter Club. Uh, that's Sunday morning. And of course, uh, I can't be there all the time. I mean, I covered the game uh, on Friday, uh, and then I went to Port Coquitlam to cover another series on Saturday, and now to make it back to Burby on Sunday, that's probably too much. It's a 9.30 a.m. start. I did follow the game on Twitter, though, and uh, according to the t- Twitter feeds, Captain Keegan Jones of the Giants, number 17 uh, for Vancouver Northwest, scored from his own blue line in the first pair while playing shorthanded, um, so that was on a Royals power play. So I'm assuming it was a simple clearing attempt, and it went all the way down and got past the goalie. Now, I didn't see the goal, so that's what I assume based on how they described it on Twitter. Kind of like a, kind of like what Ray Bork did for Boston one time against Hartford's K. Whitmore, I'm assuming. Anyway, it was one nothing on a fluke goal, um, and nobody else scored the rest of the period, and in the second period as well, uh, nobody else scored. So it was a one nothing going to the third period. It looked like the Giants would advance on that fluke goal. Uh, again, a, a, uh, I guess a, just a clearing pass or a clearing attempt from the blue line by Captain King and Jones that went um, that beat the, the South Line goaltender for the one nothing lead. Um, by this time I was actually out of the house and I was on my way to the rink after, you know, running some errors. I was trying to make it to the you know, make it for the third period, but being on the Sunday, uh, transit was bad, so I kept checking Twitter on the bus, make sure I wasn't missing anything important. And then I, I saw on Twitter that the Royals tied it up with three minutes left in the third period. So that meant possibly overtime for the third straight game. And I was actually on the bus literally just five minutes away from the rink and uh, I got off the bus when it arrived near the rink and I was walking toward I was walking quickly toward the venue to try and catch the overtime and as I approached I saw in the distance people filing out already <laughs> and uh, I saw the bus with the rows ready to, to pick up their bags and stuff like that so I checked Twitter again I was walking and I saw that um, uh, the South Island Rose tweeted that Caden Peck had just ended the game in overtime for, for the Royals and um Caden Peck, who would just celebrate his seventeenth birthday on Saturday, scored on Sunday to give the South Line Royals a dramatic two one win in overtime and he scored a series winner there. So the Giants uh were out and um they will not be participating in the finals for the first time in seven years. Kind of a stunner because um Again, they let one nothing in the you know, throughout the game and uh I believe the Royals tied up with three minutes to go. Um, but uh, I did manage to track down Coach Jackson Penny uh, of the South Island Royals as he was on his way to the bus, and he was kind enough to chat with me for a couple of minutes. We're speaking with Head Coach Jackson Penny of the South Island Royals following a big 2-1 win uh, to win the series over the Northwest Giants. Um, Coach, thoughts about this latest victory? Well, I mean, obviously I'm really happy with our boys. They, you know, they came to play for three games and they gave me 60 minutes each night and you know when your team does that anything can happen our goaltending was good we did all the little things that uh, we had to do to win and um you know when it's overtime you never know what's going to happen just put the puck in the net and uh, you know and that's what you have to do and uh, obviously uh, the, the giants had a bit had a one nothing lead throughout the game um all the way to the final minutes what was it like on the bench when the, you guys tied it with like just three minutes to go well, I, I, you know what, all I do is stress to them is that, you know what, they're the favorite team to win, and, you know, all we have to do is just keep sticking to our game plan and just keep pushing forward. You know, we had to create, for, make them make a mistake, and, uh, you know, we got lucky enough that that's what happened, and we ended up capitalizing on it. Our power play was atrocious this whole weekend, and, uh, you know what, we ended up getting one on it, and uh, it, it just turned everything around. And uh, three games in this series, three overtime games, um, I guess you guys really you know, battled hard and uh, gave the Giants everything that uh, they could handle. 
Um, so thoughts uh, how proud are you of, of your boys for um, you know ultimately winning this series? Well, you know what, like you can't. I mean, I can't say enough about the guys. I mean, they left it out, out on the ice for three straight games. You know, when it goes to overtime, and I think both teams did. You know, it was just you know it's just one of those great series that everybody likes to watch, and the kids all had fun. And you know, at the end of the day, you know, we ended up scoring the two overtime winning goals, and uh, we're moving on to the next series. I'm really proud of my guys. All right, once again, congratulations, coach, and uh, good luck the rest of the way. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure they were all anxious to get back to Victoria, uh, get home, you'll get on a bus, be ready to leave. Uh, so it was very kind of Jackson Penny, the head coach, to uh, spend a couple of minutes there chatting with me. Of course, he probably had to, you know, talk to some of the parents as well who were there, you know, get his players ready to board the bus and so on. So it was nice of him to spend a few minutes uh, for the interview. Uh, so the Giants were out. Um, what about last year's champion, the Okanagan Rockets? So uh, they hosted the Greater Vancouver Canadians, a team from Richmond, up in Kelowna. And the first game went into overtime. Now, it went into triple overtime, actually, before Kyle Yu, number 12 of the Canadians, scored to give them a 4-3 to win. Uh, Kyle Yu, of course, had 30 goals in the season, and we spoke with him late in the year. Uh, an interview which I ran on this program a few weeks back. A very soft-spoken player, but you know, clutch for sure. Uh, so that, you know, he gave the Canadians a one-nothing series lead with that overtime goal. Um, and uh, as I was looking at Twitter as well, uh, believe on Saturday he got injured in the second game, which is tough uh, for for the Greater Vancouver Canadians for sure. Uh, not sure what the extent of the injury is or how how serious it is, but uh, in that game too. The, Ro- the Rockets were the ones that fired 43 shots on goal, but they could not beat Canadian's goalie, Matteo Palachal. And uh, the Greater Vancouver Canadians shocked the defending champions 2 0 uh, to knock them out. So the Canadians got their two goals in the third period. So it was a tight game again, and it went down to the final minutes. Uh, another great series. But unfortunately, that one happened outside of the Lower Mainland, so I did not get a chance to watch it by following on Twitter. Um, so last year's two finalists, the Vancouver Northwest Giants and the Okanagan Rockets, are both out in the first round. Uh, so again, a lot of parity in the league, um, and um, you know, teams throughout the season was telling me that you know, uh, now how this year anybody could win if if uh, they play well and if they get a few breaks here and there. And uh, as we can see, the last year's champions are out, and uh, the Northwest Giants are also eliminated. So it's uh, I guess lots of surprises happening in the playoffs so far. Um, anyway, you're listening to This Week in BC Marlick Sports here on CJSF 90.1 FM. My name is KP Wee. Um, now, the number one seed, the Caribou Cougars, uh, also got a scare when the number eight seeded Fraser Valley Thunderbirds took them to three games in a best of three. Uh, the Cougars won the first game 3-1 on Friday, and then the Thunderbirds even the series with a 4-2 win on Saturday night. Um, on Sunday morning, the Cougars jumped ahead to a 3-0 lead before Fraser Valley made it 3-2 in the third period. But there was no upset here because the first place Caribou Cougars scored in the empty net in the final minute and won the game 4-2. They won the series two games to one and are now hosting the seventh place Royals in the semifinals. Now, the final quarter final series had the number three Vancouver Northeast Chiefs facing the number six Valley West Hawks. Now, I understand that the um, Planet Eyes rink in Coquitlam had some scheduling conflicts, so this series actually took place at the Port Coquitlam Recreational Center. And if you were you know, traveling from Burby or Vancouver, you would take the number 160 bus, and it takes you right there. I was there on Saturday when the series opened, so they played Saturday, Sunday for the first two games, and Monday for Game 3 if necessary. Uh, you wonder about the Chiefs because of the lack of home ice advantage. I mean, it's not their home rink that they're accustomed to, but they're playing in, uh, I guess, it's like a neutral site um, rink. And um, the crowd factor is, is that's kind of a wash because um, half of them or half of the uh Half of the uh, crowd was like uh, were parents of the Hawks, so it was like fifty fifty split. But anyway, on Saturday in the opening game, the Vancouver Northeast Chiefs went ahead two one in the second period, thanks to two goals by defenseman Callum Volpe. Um, the Hawks though scored three straight goals and make it four to two after. 40 minutes, they got a couple of power play goals late in that period to go ahead 4-2. Now, I didn't actually see this, but apparently a couple of the parents of the Hawks players saw it. They were talking about it next to me. Uh, they, they weren't talking to me, but I was there and I overheard what they were saying. Um, 
they were talking, and these were a, a couple of the um, Hawks players' parents talking. They were talking about how the Hawks were c- kind of seemed kind of overconfident and was celebrating prematurely at the end of that second period. So the parents they were kind of concerned about that. Uh, you, you know, perhaps they were too cocky, if, if you will. So you have to wonder if the Chiefs saw that and how they would react in the third period. While early in the final period. Callum Volpe scored his third goal of the game to cut the deficit to 4-3 and uh, there was there are three hats that flew onto the ice from the stands that cel- to celebrate that hat trick goal it was kind of neat uh, the Chiefs were carrying the play in that final period and they tied it shortly after with number 10 Parker Colley getting the tying goal when then 4-4 now with 10 minutes and 38 seconds left in regulation guess who scored that's right that was uh Callum Volpe with his fourth goal of the game, so four goals, uh, and the Chiefs are ahead five to four. Now Volpe had ten goals in the regular season. He's a defenseman for um, the team, and uh, ten goals in the regular season, but four in the first playoff game. Five four for the Chiefs at that point, and Harris Pierce scored about a minute later, to make it six to four. Now Valley West scored with just over six minutes left in regulation to make a one goal game, and then the Hawks got a late break when the Chiefs were given a double minor penalty, so that meant four minutes of power play time with about six minutes to go. The Hawks actually got some good shots on goal trying to tie the game, but um, the goaltender for the Vancouver Northeast Chiefs, Liam McCloskey, made some good glove saves there um, during that uh, shorthanded situation and the Chiefs scored into an empty net late in the game and hung on for a 75 victory to open uh, their playoff um, series. Now here's, a number one, here's the game's number one star, defenseman Colin Volpe, with his thoughts after the game. We're speaking with Callum Volpe of the Vancouver Northeast Chiefs following a big 75 win over the Valley West Hawks to open the playoffs. Uh, four goals for you tonight. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, really, it was just a team effort out there. I know it sounds like pretty cliche, but... I mean, my teammates were distributing the puck really well tonight. We were moving it well. We were skating with speed and getting lots of shots, and I was lucky enough to pop for it. Uh, what did you think, or what, what did you feel when you saw hats uh, flying into, onto the ice um, from the from the stands? It was a pretty special feeling. I've actually I've never got a hat trick before, so that was pretty cool to see the hats going. And we had a great crowd out there tonight, and we did a really support. It was awesome. And um, your fourth goal actually put uh, put you guys up for good. Uh, that gave you guys a 5-4 lead at that point. Uh, what do you remember about that so fourth goal? Oh, I just I heard every, all the cheers, and uh, I looked over the bench, and they were going nuts. And it just really boosted our team's confidence, and then we just stuck together in the third, and we pulled it out. And um, what do you guys need to do in order to uh, perhaps uh, potentially win this series over the Hawks? Uh, tomorrow, we just need to come out and do the same thing. We know they're a tough team. They like to hit us hard, and uh, we just got to be prepared for that and move the puck look like we did today and get lots of shots, and uh, we'll be just fine tomorrow. And I uh, just want to touch on the uh, late penalty that you guys had in the uh, final minutes. You guys had a double minor uh, against you. Um, talk about how big that penalty kill was uh, to, to preserve the lead there. Oh, it was huge. Uh, the boys rallied together. I know Santillo, you know, he wasn't too happy with himself. I mean, it was a tough play, but it happens. And it was a four minute, and we just pulled it all together. And we really committed there, blocking shots and getting the puck out. And we, we did it there. We killed it off really nicely. All right, awesome. Uh, again, thanks so much, Callum. Uh, four goals tonight. Uh, big 7-5 win over the Valdez Hawks. Uh, once again, congratulations and good luck the rest of the way. Thank you very much. And here's ZM Kareem, who scored the empty netter. Actually, he could have passed a puck to Callum Volpe at the blue line to try and get his fifth goal of the game, but it was a you know, one-goal affair at that time, and Kareem had the open net, so that was a safe play, but I guess you wonder about that anyway. But uh, here's Kareem um, with his thoughts. We have Zian Kareem of the Vancouver Northeast Chiefs following a big 7-5 win over the Valley West Hawks in Game 1 of the playoffs. Um, five goals in the third period for the boys. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, uh, going to mission in the second period, we had no doubts we were going to come back. Um, we've gone through a lot, of, like, uh, a lot of stuff like this in the season, and we've always come out on top, so we had no doubts at all. Now, I believe you guys beat these, uh, these guys, the Hawks, um, late in the regular season. Uh, did that give you the, the added confidence that you were going to perhaps pull this one off? Yeah, well, we, ha- we, got, we, we, we scored 18 goals in our two games against them in the last series when we played them in the season. So we knew we could, get, we could muster out the amount of goals we needed to win the game. And uh, I just want to touch on something that happened in the end of the second period. I, I didn't actually see it, but uh, a couple people in the uh, crowd were talking about it. That uh, 
seemed like the Hawks were kind of celebrating prematurely any of that second period. Uh, did you guys see that and thoughts about uh, that or, or comment about that? If, well, if you... well, I didn't see it, but um, I guess it's not it's not the biggest respectful thing to do, I guess, and maybe think about it next time. All right, and uh, finally, uh, what would you say you guys need to do in order to um, possibly uh, win this series moving forward? They just play like we did today and just believe in ourselves. We can go all the way if we want to. All right, and actually one more thing. Uh, what was your feeling when you scored the MPI goal to seal it for, for the boys? Pretty relieving. Um, we knew we had it all the way, so pretty good. All right, thanks so much again, ZM Kareem, for the, um, for the interview. And again, a 7-5 win over the Valdez Hawks. Congratulations and good luck uh, the rest of the way. Thank you. Finally, here's Harris Pierce, who got the game winner for the Chiefs. We're speaking with Harris Pierce of the Vancouver Northeast Chiefs following a big 7-5 win the Valorant Hawks in Game 1 of the playoffs. Um, you scored the game winner tonight. Um, thoughts about uh, that play? Uh, well, I just kind of threw it up the middle and my line mates caught it and uh, I went down and uh, I got the puck from uh, Long and he gave, made a beauty pass to me right in the middle and I just kind of pulled it back and shot right, to, uh, right through uh, what's his name, Walters. Right, and that turned out to be the game winner, of course. And you guys actually scored five goals in that final period to come back from a 4 2 deficit. Uh, what changed for you guys in the third period? Uh, well, obviously, we'll play with a huge game with four goals, and we all congratulated him. But it was just the energy in between periods. We just we came together as a team and we came back. And uh, there was like a a double minor in, in the final stages of the game uh, where you guys were shorthanded. Um, talk about that penalty kill and how huge it was um, you know, to, to get you to the win. Uh, well, it was very nerve wracking actually stepping on the ice, so it was a lot of pressure on me, obviously, and I just played my position and pressured well, and I ended up uh, doing well out there and killed the penalty. So. And Harris, uh, what do you guys need to do in order to um, you know, possibly take this series moving forward? Uh, well, Obviously, we can't get down like we did today in the first couple of periods. We just need to pull through and play a whole 60 minutes tomorrow. All right, uh, thanks so much uh, for the interview, Harris Pierce. Uh, again, a big victory today, and uh, good luck the rest of the way. Thank you. Now, in Game 2 on Sunday, the Chiefs scored early, and um, Matthew Davis had two goals for the for them, number 18 uh, for the Chiefs, uh, Matthew Davis scoring twice. Uh, Liam McClossey was perfect in goal, and the Chiefs, beat the Valley West Hawks 5-0 to sweep that series. So congratulations to the Vancouver Northeast Chiefs, as well as the Southland Royals, the Greater Vancouver Canadians, and the Caribou Hooters, all for winning their opening round series. And uh, you're listening to This Week in BC Minor League Sports here on CJSF 90.1 FM. The Athlete of the Week, of, of obviously, would be Callum Volpe, number 8 on the Vancouver Northeast Chiefs of the BC Major Major Hockey League. Uh, he scored four goals in one game to help the Chiefs win their playoff opener on Saturday. And um, again, the Chiefs are down four to two after the second period, and he scored uh, twice in the third period to um, and actually the fourth goal uh, of the night for him put his team up for good, and they hung on uh, the rest of the way. So definitely a clutch performance for Callum Volpe, number eight of the Vancouver Northeast Chiefs, and for that he's our athlete of the week. And for more information about the BC Major Midget Hockey League, including schedules and scores, please visit bcmml.net. That's bcmml.net. That's all for the program today. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed all the interviews and the recap. We'll talk to you again next time. I'm Jamie Sessford, and this is your CJSF Arts Report for the week of March 8th, 2015. Turning Point Ensemble with SFU Woodwards presents the playful, unique, and iconic Carnival. Enjoy a rich musical evening with Turning Point Ensemble's exceptional musicians at 8 p.m. at SFU Gold Corp Center for the Arts. Sunday. The Robert Linz Gallery presents the work of Jaden Chase Lemire in a solo exhibition in advance of. His practice examines the transient quality of memory through print, photography, and sculpture as he explores the elusive nature of remembrance. Opening reception is March 10th at 7.30 p.m. This event runs until March 31st. The Windsor Gallery brings forth new paintings by Quebec artist Paul Bellico in his new exhibition, Vinitas. An expert in drawing, painting, and engraving, Bellico's art has been described as pictorial archaeology. Running until March 25th, the Windsor Gallery is located at 258 East 1st Avenue. For CJSF, I'm Jamie Sesford.